Hello, I'm Robert Royal, and these are the podcasts of The Catholic Thing. We're delighted to have with us again, because we had him uh, on this series uh, when we were both in Rome. Uh, we're delighted to have Larry Chapp, who is a retired theologian. He taught for many years at the Sales University in Pennsylvania. Um, he's now run, he now runs a farm in Pennsylvania. And uh, he's, I think, one of the most incisive and uh, uh, insightful and frank commentators on what's going on in the church and the world. So, Larry, it's great to have you back with us. Um, it's br great to be here again, and thank you for those kind words. Most generous. Thank you. No, it's just it's just a, a truthful description. We tell truths at, at the Catholic thing. I, I want to get you back on in particular because you recently wrote an article about the problems with what you perceive to be as the, a church uh, theology from below. Um, I'm familiar with that term, but I don't think many of our listeners or viewers are. Can you explain? And, and by the way, I want to encourage anybody who's following this podcast to go to the Catholic World Report, where uh, Larry has been writing frequently. He's written for us at the Catholic thing as well. But to follow him and to read that article in particular, because I thought that it really explained a lot of what many of us are worried about these days. Yes, well, it it sort of begins, you have to begin with a sort of theology of grace. And it goes back in some ways to Karl Rahner's theology of grace that wanted to really emphasize how God's movement of the Holy Spirit is so unconstricted by the church or the normal pathways of salvation history that it just spills out everywhere. So it, it leads to a sort of what I call a runaway theology of grace, where every single human being in their own subjectivity is already walking around with salvific grace. And so their fundamental mental subjective experiences, and here's the key, are little little places where revelation can be discerned. Revelation isn't just discerned from the Bible and church tradition and Catholic saints. Every single human being is already so engraced, so filled with the Holy Spirit. And you see this in the synodality thing as well, right? That people are going to sit around chairs and say, how did the Holy Spirit speak to me today it was I was having my morning granola and things like this? Well, that's all fine and good. We all discern the Holy Spirit in our lives. But there's a kind of serious theology, progressive theology, that wanted to take subjective experience and use it as the starting point for moral theology. Because after all, the Holy Spirit is there. The Holy Spirit has engraced our subjectivity, our concrete experiences. And to begin from experience, subjective experience, rather than the revealed objective truths of Revelation. Now, those objective truths are not denied, and that's the slippery part. They're not rejected, and so they remain within the boundaries of orthodoxy, but they are then turned into mere ideals. These are sort of abstractions. They're true, but they're abstractions, and they're ideals. They're a kind of genus under which the, the individualistic species of each and every human being, idiosyncratically now constructed as a little walking vessel of the Holy Spirit, that's, that's where the focus of moral theology has to become. So pastoral practice is going to have to wedge itself now as a negotiator between the bubbling up of the Holy Spirit from below and negotiate the interfacing of that with the abstract truths of revelation. Now, you see this in Pope Francis all the time, where he's constantly pitting truth against mercy, compassion against, uh, against, against doctrine, and so on. That explains what he's talking about. He's not denying the doctrines or the truths. He's saying they're just abstractions, they're ideals. And it's a kind of rigid, backwardist Pharisaism to develop a moral theology that begins with that rather than the concrete lived experiences of people. So that's a kind of moral theology from below, where you begin with messy circumstances and then work your way up from there. You know, I've had the experience, uh, you probably recall this too, when I first came across this phrase, theology from below, it was it was liberation theology in the 1980s. Yes. And, and both Joseph Ratzinger and John Paul II played a lot, paid a lot of attention to liberation theology, Ratzinger actually issued two de two uh, um, analyses. One, what was wrong with liberation theology was, as it was known in the eighties, Marxist liberation theology, and the other, what true Christian liberation would be. And the Holy Father just met with a group of um, people who are in a Catholic. Uh, communist dialogue and said uh, notoriously that, that they're engaged in a common project and they're trying to work together. I always look back at that time and I remember some, one of the uh, 
one of the people who kind of defected, a Catholic who defected from liberation theology as it was practiced in Nicaragua and El Salvador back in those days. And he said that one of the problems for him was that when, when you had a Christian Marxist dialogue, Christians very often were becoming Marxists, Marxists almost never, and I think he might have even said to me, yeah. never become Christian. So um, can you, I mean, can you look at that aspect of the thing? Oh, too? Because yes, we I, have I'm, experience of, of what that that theology from below actually resulted in, which was a just a holocaust of human beings. Oh, yeah. I mean, the idea is it, it, coming together with this notion of the Holy Spirit bubbling up from below in equal measure to divine revelation from above. That then e easily gets sublimated under the, the philosophy of Hegel and, and Marxist philosophy of history, where there's this uh, inner, what they call the dialectic of history, okay, where, where the proletarian, the needs of the working classes uh, are, are neglected. And so it's a big class struggle. But out of that clash and out of that class struggle is emerges what is essentially the truth of things, the truth of history. And the truth is the eventual conquest of the proletariat in this class struggle. And so that then easily then turns into liberation theology, where they start talking about comunidades de base, the base Christian communities, where the Holy Spirit is sort of bubbling up in the proletariat, bubbling up in the working class. This is what they meant by preferential option for the poor. They didn't mean that we should have endless compassion for the poor, as Christ meant. They meant that it is within the poor that we find the true meaning of history. And in this almost secular, dynamical Hegelian sense. Uh, and then that is then pitted against hierarchy. And then the church's hierarchy and the church's dogmas come to be viewed as simply part of the class struggle and part of what the proletarian is struggling against. So when Pope Francis says there's this common mission, common project that Christianity has with Marxism, what is he talking about? It's an ideology, as you said, that's killed hundreds of millions of people, Marxism. And, and you know, if, if he wants to say, okay, we can make somewhat common cause because somewhere way down on the ladder of the hierarchy of goods within Marxism is a belief that we need to help the poor of the world. OK, and so we can we can concur with that. So let's let's make happy face and get along with one another on helping the poor of the world. But to say that we have a common project, a common mission, I, I, I think that's shocking and scandalous and adds weight to the criticisms of those who see in this papacy a false secular notion of a broad fraternity of the human family, solidarity rooted in a more secular consensus than a Christian one. Yeah, and that secular consensus, I think, as a lot of us know in, in the developed countries, especially here in the United States, I mean, we've been talking a lot about how um, these things are all based on inequalities of power. I mean, that's a very yes. Marxist idea that yes. wherever there are in inequalities of power, it doesn't reflect um, the, the hierarchies of reality, the hierarchies of the church, the hierarchies of revelation, but that they have to be somehow equalized. And that's where the term equity has, has replaced e e even yeah. uh, equality. I want to quote you back to yourself and get your comment about this, um, because I like the way you speak frankly about this. I, I mentioned that, but I, I, I really think a lot of our viewers and listeners will appreciate you because of that frankness and fearlessness, frankly, and, and I'm not just Thank you. I'm not just flattering you. I, I'm, I'm saying that truthfully. You said in that article about the theology from below that the endlessly kind church that pits mercy against truth is a grift of the highest order. Now, grift is a very strong term. What exactly do you mean by that? Well, grift, I, I mean that it's a kind of con game. And a con game is where you, you the, the classic con game is a sort of bait and switch. But here I refer, it's, it's more of uh, you, you, you present yourself as this, this Christian institution, which historically has involved the need for repentance from sin and conversion and availing yourselves of all the means of grace in order to do that. And then you, 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 but, but instead of presenting those truths of your religion, you present something else, which is not really a truth of your religion. 
where mercy is reduced to kindness, where compassion is reduced to mere kindness, uh, as C.S. Lewis calls it. We, we, we present not a heavenly father in the sky uh, who gives us the moral law, but a senile benevolence who simply sort of pats us on the head and says, there, 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 do whatever you want. A good time was had by all. So in a sense, we, we, we present this to the world and say, here, come on in. This is what we're really all about now. This is what the church is about. It's about endless uh, endless kindness, and we demand nothing of you, and we don't demand sanctification. We don't demand conversion. So come on in. And then once they come in, all right, then they discover, oh, wait a minute. Uh, there's actually some other thing in this church <laughs> that doesn't go along with that message. And so they're, they're brought in kind of under false pretenses. And then I don't, that they're, they're, the roots are not going to be deep and they're going to fall away. So that's why I call it a grift. It's, it's, it's a ploy, a very superficial one for getting people into the church. But, but there's no strategic plan for keeping them there beyond that message of kindness. I'm going to quote you again. Uh, I want you to, to spin this out a little bit further for us because you warn this, and, and I'm quoting here. There is the constant tendency of turning commandments into mere ideals, which when actually treated as commandments are dismissed as a form of theological ideology. The Holy Father just this week, as we're recording uh, in early January, dismissed what he called ecclesial ideolo ideologies without specifying. So the, these, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the uh, these commandments are dismissed as a form of theological ideology that is backward looking in its orientation. So commandments are out, sin is out, ideals and falling short are in, which is, again, something quite yeah. different than yeah. historic Christianity. Yeah, Pope Francis talks about this all the time. In fact, he's invented an, an entire Italian word in, in what's it, Indiestro? Indiatrismo. Yeah, Indeatrismo, yes, it's backwardist, backward looking, backwardist. Uh, and so it's he never bothers to really define what he means by it. But if you look at all the, the buzzwords that he used when he's describing, when he's critiquing uh, a kind of theology that he doesn't like, it's rigid, it's ideological, it's backwardist. And then when you begin to peel back the layers of that, you begin to discover that what he means by that are people that insist on historic traditional Catholic orthodoxy, uh, that people who insist on the truth of Catholic doctrines. Uh, and, and so Pope Francis's ploy, as I mentioned earlier, where they're talking about moral theology from below, and he does this all the time, you see it in Amoris Laetitia, where moral commandments are turned into ideals. And the tactic that he uses to do this is he says, look, none of us are morally perfect, right? The Eucharist isn't a prize for the perfect, but it's, you know, medicine for the sick. And, and, and even uh, uh, Cardinal Fernandez in Fiducia Supplements has said, no one is morally perfect, therefore we can't demand moral perfection before we give a blessing. And so, so they're constantly trotting out this straw man, this caricature of moral perfection, all right? And in, in the case of, of dogma, it's like, well, dogmatic perfection. Nobody ever achieves that. And so we're all on this graduate, graduated scale where we approximate living out uh, these, these dogmatic commandments or the moral commandments of the church. And because we're on a graduated scale, well, well that means that, therefore, obviously the doctrines are merely ideals since none of us live up to them. And that's exactly what Pope John Paul II in Veritati Splendor, I believe it's maybe section 78, could be elsewhere, where he, he condemns what he calls the gradualness of the law. There's, there's the right. law of gradualism, and every pastor pursues that, right? Where you bring people along gradually from where they are, softly, softly, with compassion and forgiveness, <coughs> because sinners are going to fall, and we all fall. But the, the pastoral law of gradually bringing people into the fullness of the faith is different from what he calls the, the, the gradualness of the law, which means that because people are on different pathways, uh, different levels on the pathway, the law itself now has to be tailored to them so that what they're doing is no longer even a violation of the law because they're following their conscience. It's the best, as the Morris Laetitia says, it's the best they can offer to God right now. It's the most mm -hmm. generous thing they can give to God right now. And, and Morris Laetitia says in chapter 8, and they can rest with a peaceful conscience that, they, that God blesses this. That's the gradualism of the law. That's the turning yeah. of the commandment into an ideal. They, and it's something that we don't have to pay attention to as a commandment. Yeah. 
uh, toward the end of your article, I think you, you, you start to turn to look at what might be a more positive element in what's going on right now. I'm going to quote from you again. And right at the very moment when the world is most ripe for a Christological re-enchantment, we get a rebarbative church of psycho-blathering bromides about listening and parousia and openness. Parousia means boldness and speaking out, of course. But all on a purely horizontalist plateau and all safely within the imminent frame. Say what you will about traditional moral theology and its emphasis upon the object of the acting person's choosing. At the very least, it begins and ends with a fulsome, even prodigal affirmation that we are more than mere pieces of thinking meat. That kind of traditional moral theology fits well within an enchanted world of supernatural connections. Now, that resonated a lot for me because I come across a lot of people who are searching. I mean, they write me and they, they follow right. the Catholic thing, our podcasts and papal posse. And people are hungry for this because they live in a materialist world uh, that seems to be closed off to not only God, but to human meaning. We see this more and more even in young people. Yeah. They're searching yeah. for something. I was very distressed during the uh, the uh, uh, Synod on Youth a few years ago. I was there. I was covering it for the, the Catholic thing. And young people were coming there and, and more or less saying to the church, um, we're seeking. Tell us something. And the people who were running the synod, the the, uh, the bishops, etc., were more or less saying, "Well, we need to listen to you. What do you need?" And, and they weren't actually listening to what people were were, were uh, asking about. What are the prospects for this reenchantment and and for this kind of affirmation of life has meaning? I think the prospects long term are good. Short term, I really don't know. So, I mean, short term, I'm pessimistic. Uh, but the Holy Spirit's a funny bird and can turn things around rather quickly, very, very quickly. We don't know what trigger wire, what trip wire circumstance might cause uh, the the setting on fire of the church in favor of a new a new spirit of of, of Christological holiness. You never know. Uh, but you know, just looking at it from a strictly human point of view, as I look, at, I I don't think the short term prospects are very good because the current leaders of the church seem really bent on, on in a sense, dumbing the gospel down, watering it down, tailoring it to the zeitgeist, tailoring it to the, to the spirit of the times, ignoring the fact that there's been a control in this experiment called liberal Protestantism, and even 60 years now of liberal Catholicism, where wherever that's tried, it's an abject failure. People walk away from it in droves because they can get the truths that are presented by progressive Catholicism, the simple generic truths of humanitarian sort of living. They can get that elsewhere. They don't need the church to give that to them, and they don't need the sacraments to give that to them. So the church becomes a redundancy, a giant redundancy when it simply parrots the, the prevailing zeitgeist and very horizontalist. When you look at, when you analyze, you talk to people, I talk to people, when you look at why do people convert to the Catholic Church, is that not the number one question we need to be asking? Why do people convert to Catholicism? And then maybe two, why do people revert to Catholicism? Or why do people stay in Catholicism? And what you find over and over again in those conversations, you know, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You know, what they seek is, is Christ, and the church gives them Christ. They don't need ph philanthropy. They don't need a false secular humanitarian. They're looking to puncture the total depressive, oppressive naturalism and anti-supernaturalism of our time. They're seeking magic and re-enchantment and joy and supernatural things. And that's what the church needs to be doubling down on. Well, Larry, we're at the end of our time, and um, I, I, I'm sure we're going to bring you back because we are in the final year of synodality, and no doubt uh, yeah. we're going to have things to discuss, not only about synodality, but many other things in 2024. But thank I'd you for that article. Back. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, that very, very incisive article, and I hope that, that people who have been watching and listening will go to Catholic World Report and, um, and read it in, in, in full, and then follow uh, what you've been doing there. Uh, and and with the Catholic thing and and elsewhere. Um, since I married, I've mentioned the Catholic thing. I also want to encourage everyone who's who's uh, listening or watching to subscribe to the Catholic thing, which you can do for free. The Catholic thing is a daily uh, column series. I don't call it a blog. I 
call it a column series because we want to have something a little bit more elevated. Um, you can simply go to www.thecatholicthing.org. You can subscribe for free. You can also make a donation. We don't we don't discourage that. And <laughs> the um, daily column, which is only 1,000 words, you can read it quite quickly, will come into your email inbox every morning, 365 days a year. So, uh, Larry, thank you for being with us. Thank you. And all of you watching and listening, thank you. We'll see you again soon.